Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming. We have great pleasure today to host uh, Laura Hertz. Uh, Laura did her PhD uh, undergrad in Bonn University, and during this time, she visited UNSW uh, twice, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so some of you maybe remember her from her visit back then. I know that Tom Pazza remember. Uh, after that, she did her PhD in Cambridge, and then in 2003, she moved to Oxford. She's world expert in uh, organic and organic inorganic uh, semiconductors, so it will be great and very interesting to hear what you want to speak about, that it's uh, child care diffusion. So please welcome Loa. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the introduction. It's a great pleasure to be here back in s a sunny Sydney after, well, not that many years. I come back quite frequently. But anyway, so what I'd like to talk to you about today is hybrid metal halide perovskites. So there's no better way of kind of mm, giving you a motivation and showing this chart to this audience. Basically, why are we interested in these materials? The honest answer initially would be because they make surprisingly good photovoltaic cells. How good is good? Well, you see the typical NREL chart here. And this basically charts the progress of power conversion efficiencies for photovoltaic cells around from the time when I was born to today. And you can see it's been a creeping upward slope for most of these systems. Uh, you can also see that there's some fairly different ranges that are occupied for different technologies. Just in case you can't read the axis, here you are at zero power conversion efficiency, and that means basically power of sunlight in to electrical power out. And right up there with that last arrow is that's 46% power conversion efficiency. So quite stunning. You could ask why we even bother with anything else at that point. And the reason is that these systems at the top are really rather complex. They tend to be all multi-junction uh, crystalline inorganics. Why is that? Well, uh, if you're looking at a solar cell, you have the issue that usually you take a semiconductor. A semiconductor has a certain band gap, and that tells you how you're going to harvest light. Uh, in essence, uh, your band gap sets the highest voltage you could get, but then also if you set that too high, then you're missing most of the sunlight, the low energy photons. And so there's a trade-off between collecting most photocurrent and having the highest open circuit voltage. And as, as a result of that, as an optimum point, Shockley Quiser uh, calculated that for a single junction cell. And the only way to move beyond that is to have these multi-junction cells where you basically sandwich more than one solar cell on top of the other with slightly different bank gaps. That's a great uh, amount of effort that you have to undertake to get there. And as a result of that, that's very expensive technology. So if you want it slightly more cheap, uh, you could go down there and go to single junction crystalline inorganics, gallium arsenide or silicon. Of course, I don't have to talk to you about silicon or that topic here. You are uh, experts in that um, already. Uh, and you can see that you can get some decent efficiencies in the sort of 20s, high 20s with that. Uh, below that, some would are SIGs, also quite decent. And as you come down this chart, uh, chart in general, it gets easier and less energy intensive to make these cells. Uh, now, around here, sort of around this area where I sort of started my career in research, there was a great deal of interest in bringing down the energy that you put in to make these cells even further. The reason for that was that silicon technology was seen as too expensive to really um, make it into the real power market. And of course, with global warming and everything around there, we really wanted to have photovoltaics take off. So people thought perhaps there is some room for a technology that is much simpler to process, much cheaper, but may not return the best efficiencies. And that's how these emerging technologies, emerging PV technologies were born. Uh, among these are organic semiconductors, molecules, and disensitized cells. And they kind of went along a little bit here in this uh, sort of red curve, you can see here, uh, sort of just breaching about 12, 13% now. Uh, but the problem has also been that, of course, or, well, actually, it's not a problem, it's a great thing in many ways, is that China picked up silicon production, and that really lowered the cost. So here we were all of a sudden. We're trying to lower cost, um, and we're, we're finding that perhaps this is no longer quite as necessary, or at least we'd need high efficiencies. And that's where perovskites came in. You can see here are hybrid metal halide perovskites. And you can see the field really in earnest only started around 2013. And it shot off like a rocket. You can see here all the way up above 20% now. And that's where this ph phenomenal interest is coming from. This came out of nowhere and it shot up here, this yellow line, like a rocket, and it's now starting to compete, certainly with amorphous silicon, and who knows where it'll head next. 
And so that's where a lot of the excitement came from. Um, but it's left behind a lot of our fundamental understanding of why these systems work so well. And that's mostly what I'd like to talk to you about today. Why are these systems so good? What's the physics behind these systems? Why can we achieve with a very low energy processing such phenomenally high efficiencies that are starting to rival what you get uh, from crystal and semiconductors? Okay, so just to give a little bit more background to those who don't work so much on photovoltaics, I don't know quite what the spread in the audience is, but one other way of looking at photovoltaics now is then to divide this into the so-called planar heterojunction solar cells and into so-called nanocomposite cells. Why do we do that? Well, as I said to you earlier, you have these very high efficiency cells, like based on silicon or gallium arsenide, and they tend to be planar heterojunction solar cells. What do I mean by that? Well, uh, the architecture is such that you just take a thin film, more or less, and that's sufficient to collect your charges. Why does that work? Well, first of all, one important parameter is the exciton binding energy. So when you take something like gallium arsenide, it's got very low exciton binding energy, a few MeV, and room temperature, thermal energy at room temperature, is about 25 MeV. So if you generate, if you absorb a photon, it creates an electron hole pair across this band gap, band, gap, band gap, but these two aren't bound to one another. They're free to move apart because thermal energies exceed exciton binding energy, and so this thing self-dissociates dissociates at room temperature. On top of that, these systems typically have high charge carrier mobilities. High charge carrier mobility means that as long as recombination doesn't occur so quickly, systems can diffuse out. Electrons and holes can diffuse to respective contacts. So you have very long charge carrier diffusion lengths. And that means that you can make the system thick enough to absorb most of the light, and yet all the charges can come out. And so typically for that you have silicon or gallium arsenide. And tends, they tended to be very highly efficient as I showed you, but quite energy intensive in terms of fabrication. So the idea then was to overcome this somehow, make something that you kind of process from solution. You just mix something up, you smear it out as a paste. For example, these nanocomposite cells, disensitized solar cells. So you take a nanocomposite of TO2, uh, you smear that, literally smear it on some surface, you sensitize it with a molecule, the molecule gets excited by the light, an electron is injected into the TR2 and the hole is carried away by an electrolyte. Why do we need that? Well, now we have organic light harvesters, in principle a good idea, that's how nature harvests light. They're very strong absorbers molecules, but the exciton binding energy is phenomenal in these systems, typically of the order of a few hundred MeV. So this system now won't spe spontaneously self-dissociate. You create an exciton on a molecule, here's an electron hole pair tightly bound together. That is not going to give you a photocurrent. So what people needed were these nanocomposites, where in essence one component takes the electron and one component takes the hole, because the energy level alignment is made such. That also means you lose some open circuit voltage, you have the problem with the stability of the nanocomposite. So there are all sorts of issues with this, and these systems never really went much beyond 10-12%. And so the question then was, where do perovskites fall? They're solution processed, they're easily processed uh, in all sorts of different ways, so they look a bit like this, and yet they're very efficient. And so <coughs> In 2013, when the first systems came out, 2012 and 2013, we asked ourselves then, what is the charge carrier diffusion length? Can you make charges diffuse through a whole thick layer of the perovskite? And so this is the sort of experiment we did here. We take a thick layer of perovskite, here seen in this uh, image here, micrograph here, a thick layer of the perovskite, you put what I call a quencher layer on top. What do I mean by that? Well, this is a layer in which the energy levels are aligned in a way that either an electron or a hole will get captured in it if it gets near the interface. Now if we excite with the light pulse from the opposite side, sort of from this end here, what we do is we get an absorption profile that falls off exponentially uh, according to Beer's law as you know, and then these charges might diffuse and as they arrive then here at this interface they will get captured and quenched. And so it takes a certain amount of time for your photoluminescence to disappear. And so that's what's shown in that graph up there. You can see the top black curve shows you a decay in photoluminescence, and if you put that quencher layer on top, you see these red and blue graphs, eh, there's a rapid decay, a much more rapid decay in luminescence, because either the electron or hole gets extracted. You can model this, there's a very simple problem with a diffusion equation, and from that extract a diffusion constant, and from that a diffusion length. And we found this was off the order of a micron. 
That was a phenomenally long diffusion length for something that had been processed simply from solution. And the tentatives suggest that here we have something that has the best of both worlds now. You have low temperature processing, and yet you have charge carrier diffusion uh, that goes over um, you know, hundreds of nanometers, even a micron here. So all of a sudden, it's like solution processable gallium arsenide, um, as people often call it. So this is the sort of state where we are at at the moment. Uh, we have these hybrid metal halide perovskites um, that are now reaching 20% power conversion efficiencies. There's a huge range of different processing protocols. You can make this entirely from solution precursors, or you could evaporate it, then dip it into solvent, or you can fully evaporate it in a low temperature process. Uh, and um, <coughs> the uh, charge care mobilities are pretty decent, long diffusion lengths, as I'll show you in a minute, and even some light emission and lasing has been reported. I should say that there are some remaining challenges, and I'll start to sort of straddle them during the talk. Most of these best performing materials are all based around lead. Lead is great in many ways, it's abundant, it's permitted for photovoltaics, but many people don't like solution process of a lead. Mind you, if it's well encapsulated and you don't try to eat your photovoltaics, in principle it should be fine, but it's a question of whether people will be happy to adopt it as a technology. We have different uh, device concepts still. A lot of people are now tending towards this planar heterojunction uh, concept, where really, very simply, you just have an electron transporting material, a hole transporting material, and a layer of perovskite sandwiched in the middle. And this works remarkably well. But what I'd like to talk to you about today is something more fundamental, really. The technology has moved forward, but <coughs> what I'd like to talk to you about is what is the the sort of fundamental physics that's underlying um, these fantastic um, performances. Um, what governs charge carrier recombination? What governs the mobility? Why are these parameters so good for this material? And um, what are the different processes uh, that determines it? And then also, how is that then affected by composition? Because if we can understand how composition is affected, uh, affecting these parameters, we can design better materials. The general structure of the perovskite is something like ABX3, um, and you can see the structure up there um, with um, a metal uh, cation, which is two-valent, um, and an organic, typically, cation, which is monovalent, and then that's balanced by three halide um, anions, typically. And we can interchange these. We can put different things in. Instead of lead, we could have tin. Instead of metal ammonium, we could have cesium, formidinium. Uh, and so on. So what happens as we change this? It's very easily changed with the photophysics. So here's a quick outline. First of all, I'd like to talk to you about this system here, metal ammonium lead triiodide. This is what uh, has now become the fruit fly of hybrid perovskite photovoltaics. It's given the best efficiencies initially, and it's still worked on a lot. A lot of people are switching a bit to form adenium, but it's a very similar system. And I'll show you how good the system is and what determines charge carrier recombination in this material um, and uh, what we can do to tune these things. But then also, perhaps we would like the system lead free. So one of the most promising systems has been tin, metal ammonium tin triiodide or formidinium tin triiodide, but there are some problems with tin. And I'll show you what these problems are. It's got to do with the defect formation and, uh, and unintentional doping. And then finally, I'll very quickly talk to you about tandems. Tandems are very interesting because we have the existing silicon technology. Perhaps the best use for these perovskites is to just whack another cell on top. And for that, we need a band gap of about 1.7 EV. And for that, these tunable halide systems are the most promising. But there are some problems with that, and we might be able to resolve that. OK, so starting then with the fundamental photophysics of these materials. You have to realize that you know, when your photon is absorbed, you make charge carriers. Turns out the binding energy, exciton binding energy in these systems is also very low. So we get charge carrier pairs, electrons holes, they're free, they're not correlated, they can move around. And so what limits uh, performance in these systems is charge carrier combination. What does that mean? So we have to understand, first of all, what are the different processes that, that happen in these materials. And so they are listed here. These are the three processes we are aware of that are happening in these materials. The first one here is trap-mediated recombination. What do I mean by that? Well, it's drawn there. Say you have an electron trap, you create an electron hole pair, but it's only the chance of the electron finding this trap that determines 
um, recombination here. So it's a monomolecular uh, process that just depends on, well, the density of traps in essence. And so it gives you mono-exponential uh, recombination kinetics. Um, and it tends to be non-radiative in these systems. It's different, a bit, little bit different from gallium arsenide. Uh, then on the other hand, we have bimolecular recombination, called so because you need two particles, an electron and a hole. And it's basically just the reversal of absorption. If you have absorption in a direct semiconductor, you take an electron from the valence band, promote it into the conduction band, uh, and then they may recombine with the reverse process. And since this is a direct semiconductor, which is what you want it to be, because you want good absorption, uh, the reversal is also radiative. And you need it. If it's not there, you don't have absorption. Finally, you have Auger recombination. That's shown here. Um, what happens there is that you have, say, three particles. Your electron combines with the hole, but it kicks its energy off to another electron, say, here. It doesn't have to be another electron. could be a hole as well. Uh, and that electron takes the energy and momentum away. That means the process is non-radiative. And you can see that it has to end back up on the band structure. It also has to uh, satisfy energy and momentum conservation, which means these arrows are opposite and equal. And so you can see that here in a left diagram that's achieved by taking a phone on a lattice vibration, which takes away the momentum. Uh, and here we just end up uh, on, say, a split-off band, for example. So split-off bands matter a lot for Auger recombination. Uh, and so these are the three different processes. Here we are non-radiative, this is radiative, this is non-radiative. And you can see that since they involve more and more charges, um, actually what happens is that if you write the rate equations, so your change in charge current density, the n by dt, is given by your generation rate. And then for this, this process here, it's just minus k1n. It just depends on the charge current density n here. This is bimolecular, you need electrons and holes, and you create them in pairs. So your electron density and your hole density are equal, n equals p. So you have an n square here, so you get minus k2n square. And here you get three of them, so it's minus k3n cubed. Or in other words, you can write a recombination rate, an effective recombination rate. It looks like this and depends on charge carrier density. And so depending on where you are with your charge carrier density, different processes matter. Uh, at very low light levels, you're here. And as you increase your absorption, you have higher charge carrier densities, you move over to here. And so to understand really what's happening, uh, you have to, to look at this and determine all these different rates constants, figure out what they depend on, and then also learn from that what is actually active at solar irradiation densities. So how do we do that? Well, we do it with um, time resolved spectroscopy. Uh, here's an example of what happens. If you excite the sample with one short pulse and then monitor the charge carrier density as a function of time after excitation. If you're in a very low fluence regime and we just monitor the photoluminescence here over hundreds of nanoseconds time scale, you see this is mono exponential. And that's basically because now we're just solving uh, this rate equation here just for this part here. So this is out and we're here and that's just a mono exponential decay. Now, as we are cranking up the excitation fluence, on the other hand, and looking at now a very short time scale here over thousands of picoseconds, you can see that as we make the excitation pulse more and more, contain more and more photons, so make it more and more intense, the charge carrier decay gets faster and faster. And that's because now bimolecular and Auger recombinations start to kick in. And they depend on the density, and so here you see faster and faster decays. And so from fitting these curves, doing a complete global fit. We can then extract these different constants, k1, k2, k3. Um, but we can also get, and this is crucial for this, the charge carrier mobility, because what we're actually measuring in this technique is the photo-induced conductivity at terahertz frequencies. And so by dividing that by the number of created charge carriers, uh, we then get a mobility. It's photoconductivity divided by charge carrier density gives you an effective mobility. OK, so what have you learned from these systems? So first of all, what do we understand about trap mediate re recombination? This is the recombination that will always, to some extent, be there. It has to do with how well we have made our material, what kind of traps are contained, how likely is the system to form traps at all. Uh, and so we can vary the temperature. Not that you care about that too much for a solar cell, but it's an important way of ad identifying what these trap states are. And you can see that as we lower the temperature further and further, this recombination rate slows down a lot. Uh, 
we should also, one thing we need to keep in mind is that we go through three different phas phases in this system. All of these metal halide perovskites have got a propensity to switch very quickly their crystal structure. It's because you can tilt these octahedra ever so slightly and it gives you a different crystal structure. So all of them have these strange phase transitions, well not so strange, but here from cubic to tetragonal, here to also rhombic. And sometimes you see very strong energy shifts when that happens. So we're going through all these three different phases here uh, in this system. Here's a sort of plot of the activation energy that you basically need to activate uh, this trapping process. We're still trying to understand exactly where this activation comes from, but perhaps one way of seeing it is to say that these are ionizable impurities and this activation energy is somehow needed to basically create this defect. But if that's so, then basically these are shallow traps. 20 MeV is fairly shallow, and that's one of the reasons for why these systems work so well. You have traps that are only of the order of 20 MeV in depth. You can also plot how that affects the charge carrier diffusion length in this low fluence regime versus temperature here. And that's important because your solar cells operate through a whole range of different temperatures. So you have to go be able to go up to 70, 80 degrees centigrade when they're illuminated. You can see your diffusion length here declines as you do that. There are two reasons for that. One is what I've just shown you, which is that uh, trap-related recombination is accelerated. And the other is that your charge carrier mobility actually declines. OK, so now coming to another question, which is what happens with bimolecular recombination? So you remember this is electron meets hole, and they recombine. So there's actually a very, very simple model for this, uh, which is the Langevin model. Uh, this is always tested for when people look at new photovoltaic materials. And the reason is that it's a very simple model. What you have here is you say, here's an electron, here's a hole, they approach each other, and basically, um, as this electron is descending into this Coulomb well that's created by the hole, there's a point here where it has descended more than kT. And so that means that thermal energies aren't sufficient to activate it out of this well. And so uh, as a result of that, it can no longer get out and recombination occurs. The approach speed of that electron into this Coulomb well is proportional to the mobility of that charge. And so as a result of that, Langevin predicted uh, that your K2, your bimolecular charge recombination rate, should be proportional to the mobility. And this is really a first year electromagnetism problem if you integrate over this whole sphere of incoming charges. You can show that the ratio of K2 and mu is given by the elementary charge over the dielectric function. And people have tested their systems against Langevin for many decades. Here's an example for anthracene where this works rather well. It only works in the case of low mobility materials, otherwise your electron kind of zooms over and it doesn't work doesn't make any more sense. But you can see here for these perovskites, this is out by probably five orders of magnitude. So when we found this, we, we got quite shocked by this. We thought, ooh, five orders of magnitude out. And what it means is that you can have a much, much, much higher mobility for the same amount of absorption. Uh, and the question is, why is that? So we've been looking into this a little bit further. Here's something else that's interesting. What happens with bimolecular recombination as we lower the temperature? So we can now measure these, these dynamics for all sorts of different temperatures. And you can see that as you go in temperature, this gets faster and faster, this bimolecular component. Why is that? Well, we can extract K2, and you can see it goes up by two orders of magnitude as you go from room temperature to near zero Kelvin. And one way in which we might understand that is similar to the way in which we've looked at gallium arsenide. You can do the same thing in gallium arsenide. What happens is that because you're cooling the system, the thermal occupation near the band edge gets narrower and narrower because it's no longer thermally smeared near the band edge. And as a result of that, you get better overlap there and better recombination. And so this enhances your recombination dynamics. And similar uh, factors are seen when you look at gallium arsenide. Uh, so that's quite interesting because it tends to suggest that perhaps we can understand these systems not so much from this molecular picture, but rather from a band structure picture, similar to a gallium arsenide. OK, so how about Auger recombination? So first of all, it probably won't matter hugely. The uh, typical Auger constants we get in these systems are off the order of 10 to the minus 28 centimeters to the 6 per, per second. Um, you can calculate very easily that this will only kick in at charge carrier densities that are 100 times higher than what you get under solar illumination. 
Why does it matter? Well, people are thinking of using these systems for light emission and lasing. Uh, it's also fundamentally quite interesting. And of course, if you went for solar concentrator applications, it would also matter. So what happens with OG? Well, uh, again, we can measure the OG rate constant as a function of temperature. And here what you see is really quite interesting. You see here you have different crystal structures here, and you have different temperature dependencies. What we were expecting was a strong dependence on band structure and phonons, which carry wider momentum. And that's exactly what we see here. Very strong temperature dependencies, but their nature changes phenomenally depending on which crystal structure you're in. So I think that um, if we tune the band structure, we could actually lower these OGE rates phenomenally just by understanding this and basically from first principles calculations, calculating what sort of band structure we need, in particular the split of band position, uh, to change um, OGE rates. Okay, so something else that matters for charge extraction is charge carry mobility. Uh, and again, in this high-performing systems, metal ammonium lateral iodide, we've investigated this in some detail. And here again, there were a few surprises. So <coughs> one thing we can do with this technique is we can actually measure a conductivity spectrum. So this is the photo-induced conductivity here, basically proportional to that. It's a function of terahertz frequency. Uh, and this is the imaginary part and the real part, because what we measure is this terahertz single cycle pulse, and we just Fourier transform it, and that gives us the conductivity spectrum. Uh, and the interesting thing is that what we measured here was an almost constant positive real part of the conductivity and a zero imaginary part. Why is that interesting? Well, because it fits this very simple Druder model perfectly. In the Druder model, basically, that's what gives you Ohm's law. What you have there is that uh, your charge is accelerated, it scatters off something, bonk, down it goes again, its velocity goes down, it accelerates again, down goes the velocity again. And there's a certain time between these um, scattering intervals, that's called the momentum relaxation time, and that is what determines your conductivity. That's why Ohm's law holds, that's why your current is proportional to the applied field. And these systems seem to obey that. That seems pretty obvious to you, maybe, because gallium arsenide does, any metal does, any good, well-conducting metal does. But in most solution process materials, you do not see that. So here we ha again have a system that shows us what gallium arsenide shows us, but that is just mixed up in a little solution jar, spread out, and then just forms this very nice crystalline material. We see something else that, again, is very resemblant of gallium and arsenide, which is the change in mobility with temperature. So as we reduce uh, the temperature, the mobility goes up by about a factor 10 here. So you can see uh, it shoots up. That is, again, typical of a system where mobility is limited only by scattering with the lattice, with phonons. Typically what you see in more dirty systems with impurities is that it's the opposite, um, that um, well, you see impurity scattering, or in molecular systems even, the conductivity goes up with temperature because you need some sort of activation energy. It's a very strongly polaronic effect, and so you need some activation to move this charge along. So again, it looks exactly like gallium arsenide. And it suggests that at, these, at room temperature we get about 30 square centimeter per volt second, which may not be brilliant compared to gallium arsenide, but um, it's probably not going to go up by many orders of magnitude from there because we're already running into a system where we're not limited by crystalline boundaries or defects in there. Okay, so um, why does all of this matter? Well, it gives us a feeling for how easy it is to extract charges and we can also now try to start and predict where we can go if we took all the traps out of this system. So, what you can see here is the charge carrier diffusion length that we can calculate as a function of the injected charge carrier density here. Uh, and we calculate that simply by the usual equation. Here's your charge carrier diffusion length. It's mu kT over elementary charge times the recombination rate. And of course, this recombination rate is now made up of all these three contributions here, k1, nk2, and square k3, as I showed you earlier. So all these different processes kick in. And the great thing about that is we can calculate what would happen if you took, in essence, all the traps out. K1 is trap-related recombination. If you took all the traps out, it would be zero. So we're basically going here. And K1 is, of course, here expressed as a rate. 
or as a lifetime here, the red curve is where typical materials are standing at the moment. And that gives us diffusion lengths of the order of, say, three microns. And that's been measured, more or less. Uh, but if we took traps out and got longer PL lifetimes in the low fluence regime, we could go much higher. And you can see, in fact, if all the traps were taken out, really a charge carrier diffusion length has becomes a full function of the charge carrier density. And it could be anything. In theory, it could be meters, of course. Now that is meaningless, because what we really have to ask ourselves is, what is the charge curve density at AM 1.5? And therefore, what is the charge curve diffusion length at that point? And so we can calculate that as well. It's not very hard. Uh, here's our absorption uh, coefficient spectrum. Here's the solar uh, reference spectrum, the global tilt spectrum we took. Um, you can take these together and get a generation rate profile here. And we take, say, the average here. And we can calculate what is the charge carrier density in these materials, of course, under non-extracting conditions, just exciting and having recombination. And you can see here that um, and that's at a function here of trap-related recombination. So around here, where trap-related recombination dominates, as you take traps out and lower that, charge carrier density goes up. But here in the biomolecular regime, it stays constant. So that's roughly what your charge carrier densities are. We can map that back on this graph, and that's these arrows here. So this is where you would be at solar irradiation, roughly. Here, you'd be up there, uh, get that sort of charge curve diffusion length. And you can see that as you keep on taking more and more traps out, you're getting your converging to where these arrows up there are, so about 10 microns. And so that's sort of where your limit might go. You could still go up from there uh, in various other processes. One is you could improve the mobility, but to get to, say, this 175 that someone claimed, you'd have to have a mobility of 9,200 square centimeter per whole second. So that's quite unlikely, maybe. There could also be things like reabsorption effects and so on. But in essence, 10 microns, a few 10 microns, that's the sort of ballpark you're looking at. The other interesting thing we can look at is this whole question of radiative efficiencies. There have been a lot of publications out there on radiative efficiencies of these materials. Uh, People have, on the one hand, said, these are just no good. They're just no good. They don't emit. We make absolutely rubbish light emitting devices. And others have published values of, you know, 80%, 60% quantum efficiency. And here's the uh, reason for that. I showed you that these three different recombination processes. You have trap related recombination, bimolecular, and OG. Only the bimolecular is radiative. So what happens is, you crank up your charge carrier density, you go from trap related to bimolecular, to OG. And so only in this little interval there, where bimolecular is dominating, do you get a lot of light out. And that's usually the interval that people are talking about when they say it's high. They just crank up the laser excitation until they hit their sweet spot, and they say it's 60%. So you have to be a little bit careful uh, with that. And what you also see is that if you really want to sort of make good devices and be around here in this lower density regime, then you have to really take more traps out. You have to go to microsecond lifetimes in the low fluence regime. Uh, and so even passivate more of these traps uh, in the system. Other than that, you can just crank up the fluence, inject more charges. But you have to be able to do that and make a device that can do that. OK, so that's all I want to say about this prototypical material, metal ammonium lead triiodide. As I've shown you, it's a lovely material, a little bit like gallium arsenide almost despite being very flexible in its processing. But we have some issues. So the first issue, I mean, there are lots of issues actually as well that I won't be talking about. But the two issues that I want to talk to you about is this whole question of lead and what we could do to uh, perhaps get rid of it. So one of the first systems people looked at was tin. So people didn't like lead, maybe replace it with tin. So looking at metal ammonium tin triiodide here. And what we found is in these early studies is that as you look at, say, your charge carrier decay dynamics here now, uh, again, as a function of time after excitation, again, you see faster and faster decays as you crank up the fluence, so there's some bimolecular recombination. But now these curves are returning to zero within hundreds of picoseconds. If you remember the curve I showed you for the lead-based systems, they have lifetimes in the low fluence regime of 300 nanoseconds. Now we're down to 300 picoseconds. So three orders of magnitude faster trap-related recombination. We can fit the system again with a monomolecular and a bimolecular component and extract that. 
And what we find is that really it's the trap-related recombination that's different. It's not the biomolecular recombination that's a bit stronger, maybe an order of magnitude, but it's the trap-related recombination that's the issue. And the way you can understand that is that it turns out that these systems are intrinsically very prone to self-doping with holes. In that case, you have to see that now your biomolecular part is K2NP, but P is both the photogenerated part and the background hole doping density. And so that gives you a monomolecular component, and you can estimate what sort of doping density you have from that, and it's about 10 to the 18 per cubic centimeter. That's a lot. But people regularly find this, also with hole effect measurements, that these systems are phenomenally prone to self-doping. They still have pretty decent charge chem mobility, so that's not a problem, but the doping is. Here you can see again diffusion length versus carrier concentration. You can see that that's the actual case here. If you've got about 20 nanometers diffusion length, that's not enough. Uh, but if you took these charge carriers, these dopant densities out, you could easily be up here at microns. So it's just a matter of taking this background dopant density out. I say just. It tends to be, the cause of this appears to be that if you have a tin vacancy in the system, that basically gives you two hole dopant, uh, two doped holes. And so that is what we're battling against. It's basically this defect chemistry. We've recently looked at this a bit more uh, in detail by looking at the photoluminescence as a function of temperature again. And here again, the system has a phase transition at around 110 Kelvin, where it goes from tetragonal to orthorhombic. And you can see something interesting happens there. This is the PL spectra, and you can see they're very broad up there, and then they're line narrow all of a sudden at this phase transition. Uh, and this is interesting uh, because, uh, I mean, this is extracted here. You can see that here there's this decline, gradual decline, and full of us have maximum of the emission, and then all of a sudden at the phase transition, boom, it comes down. And that's interesting because the full width have maximum in these systems, we can model it. It's basically uh, dominated by scattering with these ionizable impurities. So once these are ionized, you get stronger scattering and that broadens your line width. And it tends to suggest that at this phase transition, all of a sudden, this background dopant density falls massively. And that's interesting because if you could understand that, perhaps we could engineer it somehow. This is really the case where we can look at the PL lifetimes here and see how that varies with temperature. And you can see just at the phase transition, there's this big jump in lifetimes, much longer PL lifetimes, which again is compatible with you taking out the, a fraction of this huge background dopant density and therefore getting much longer lifetimes. Now, what could be happening here? Well, at the phase transition, of course, you get slight changes in band structure. So perhaps your defect level alignment with respect to this valence band here changes slightly. Would such a, such a slight change make actually a difference? Well, it could do. If you think that to ionize this defect and actually put this electron up into this defect level and rem have this remaining hole, uh, you need some thermal energies. And so if at room temperature, these are just below Kt or just below 25 MeV, if you shift this up just by 20 or MeV or so, uh, you'd have maybe 50 MeV, and all of a sudden uh, you wouldn't need to, uh, you wouldn't have the thermal energies available at room temperature to ionize this defect. So even shifts by a few tens of MeV could stop um, this, this, not this defect from forming, but from an act really then contributing to an ionized uh, state that gives you this background dopant hole density. So. There may be a way of engineering this, and in fact, if you put formidinium in, it seems to be much more stable. So that tends to suggest that ever so slight engineering of your band structure can get rid of such defects or at least neutralize them in terms of uh, the whole doping. So finally, let me talk about something to do with tandems. Uh, this is probably also interesting uh, to this community here. Um, one way of making perovskites work could be to combine them in tandem with a uh, silicon. So then you would have to put another cell on top, um, well, depending on the structure. Uh, and for silicon, the best band gap would be at 1.7 electron volts. So if we can find a, a hybrid perovskite that gives us a band gap of 1.7 EV, we'd be pretty well placed to bundle this up with silicon, strap it all up, and get a higher efficiency cell. Uh, but there is a slight problem. So people thought of this earlier, tunable systems, because uh, the um, thormidinium or metal ammonium lead triadide system 
has a bank of around 1.5 electron volts around here. If, on the other hand, you use bromide, you'd be up there at 2.3 eV. And what you want is somewhere in the middle. So the obvious thing to do would be to mix these halides, put in a bit of iodide and a bit of bromide. And it turns out that, in principle, this idea is brilliant. You can see you can tune this through all the way from the bromide to the iodide, but then here there's a bit of a hole. And that's because here, for some reason, this crystal structure doesn't form well. You see that here in the XRD, uh, here's the bromide system at the top, there's the iodide system at the bottom, nice XRD peaks, but in the middle, they disappear. So the system's quite amorphous, it doesn't like to form. And the reason for that is that basically, this one here is trigonal, here it is cubic, and as you're tuning through, there's this middle bit, where it can't quite make up its mind. Does it want to be cubic or trigonal? So it kind of segregates into iodide-rich, bromide-rich clumps of material. And it's not very nice and crystalline. You can see that here as well. At the top, you see the photoluminescence. It tunes through nicely with, from bromide to iodide. But there's another problem, which is that if you illuminate these systems for some time, especially in the central region, where they're not very stable, they change. You can see here that all of a sudden much more emission comes from, from something that looks like it's iodide rich. And so under light illumination, the halides start to move around and they segregate. And you get iodide rich and bromide rich phases. Um, no, but it's not totally understood yet why that happens and how it happens, but still it happens. And that, of course, is bad news. So what we wanted to do first is examine this central region a bit better. Uh, and we've done that looking at it by not illuminating it quite so strongly. If you do that, it doesn't shift. And so with these terahertz measurements, we're able to examine the system while it's in its original state. And that's what you see, basically. You have this central region, even before any halide segregation has occurred. And you see the trap later recombination is much higher. The mobility crashes right down there to, well, below one square centimeter per volt second, and you are broadening of your emission gets really large as well. And so there's this big disordered region where the charge care mobility is low, the disorder is high, crystalline domains don't form very nicely. Uh, and that's a big problem. The charge share diffusion length also dips right down here. So what can we do about that? Well, first of all, you can still do some interesting physics in that region, looking at just the fundamental recombination kinetics. And that's, of course, your K2, your biomolecular recombination. And that seems to be largely unaffected by this disorder. So it just kind of gets uh, larger the more bromide you pop in. And that could be affected partly by excitonic effects, which are known to be stronger in the bromide system, and which also sort of are present above the band edge. So that could be one thing. Auger rates, again, tune also through very nicely. You go from 0% bromide to 100% bromide. And again, your Auger rates go up. And again, that's just a change in bound structure, which changes your Auger rates and so on. So that all works very nicely. But we still have a problem with this instability and the low mobilities. And so what could the answer be? Well, if the problem is that you are tuning from something that is uh, trigonal to something that's cubic here, so here you're going from cubic to trigonal, and you have this bit in the middle that's unstable where your XRD peaks disappear, then perhaps the way to go forward is to say, let's start with something that has the same crystal structures, both with the bromide and the iodide. And it turns out, and I know it sounds very peculiar, but if you sprinkle in 17% of the cesium, then all of a sudden both the bromide, pure bromide system, and the pure iodide system are cubic. And then all of a sudden, just because you've sprinkled in that little bit of cesium, your system tunes through nicely. And here you are, you've got beautiful XRD peaks all the way through. Uh, you can test these systems, see what they look like. And for that, here now we show the sort of toughest thing, which is basically right bang in the middle where everything was unstable before. So uh, that's 40% bromide. This is where we saw basically no PL really mobilities were below one square centimeter volt second and so on. And now all of a sudden we have very nice lifetimes, 150 nanoseconds under low fluences. The PL spectra are stable. We get very nice charge carrier recombination dynamics and a charge carrier mobility of about 21 square centimeter per volt second, which is really uh, quite respectable. We get three micron charge carrier diffusion lengths as opposed to, you know, I don't know, tens of nanometers and so on. And of course, Henry Snell's group, they've made 17% power conversion efficiency solar cells out of this. So this is interesting because 
what they've done there is they've, they've made a cell that they can put onto silicon and that will give you higher efficiency and will work well in terms of being matched uh, with silicon. Uh, and the material looks just as nice to us as any iodide or bromide pure system. Okay, so let me finish there now. I hope I have convinced you that um, uh, the charge carrier recombination in the system has got these three different components. It's got the trap-related recombination, which is monomolecular, the bimolecular recombination, which you do need because it gives you absorption, the OG recombination, which kicks in at very high fluences. Um, and you can use these to predict what you can get out of this material. Uh, you can get tens of microns diffusion lengths, unless you crank up the mobility somehow, uh, and you can get fairly good light emission in a certain region where biomolecular recombination dominates. For the tin, as I've shown you, there's an issue with self-doping, but we might be able to overcome that by perhaps even smaller changes in, in crystal structure. Uh, and for these mixed halide systems, if you hit a sweet spot where uh, you don't have these crystal structure changes, then you ought to be able to get stable and also photostable systems uh, that allow you to, to use these systems with um, silicon. Okay, so I, I should thank my grad students and postdocs who've been doing this work, and also, of course, the groups of Michael Johnston, there's a lot of evaporation of perovskites, and Henry Snaith, of course, who does the solution processing, materials development, and, and, um, and of course, photovoltaic cells with very high power conversion efficiencies. And I should thank you for listening and put up a shameless slide advertising. We still have one vacant position uh, on this ITN. If anyone wants to do an early postdoc with us, please come and send me an email. And I'd like to thank you for listening. Question? One simple question. Thank you very much for a nice talk. Have you realized any phonon related PL emission? Phonon related? PL yeah. In the PL emission? Um, you mean temperature activated in that way? Yes, allophonon, theophonon. Oh, you mean uh, sort of multi, sort of peak, yeah, yeah. yeah. <sighs> no, well, what we have seen is that the emission is very broadened and that in the nice systems, the metal ammonium lead triadides, this appears to be mostly due to um, carrier phonon scattering. Um, but to see actual phonon replica, we thought we saw something at some stage, but I think maybe it was the surface state. Because the system is so broad, because this electron photon coupling is quite strong by itself, um, I think it's very hard to see pronounced replica. So I haven't seen any yet. So that means this is not like gallium arsenide? Um, you mean in gallium arsenide? Yeah, you can see the photon related emission, the low temperature. It's very yeah. nice here, well, uh, electron related tension, nearly 30 is a electron volt. Yeah, that is true. I think, to be honest with you, we don't see it, ne not necessarily because it's not there, but because the emission is too broad, and in that sense would overlap it. So we've cooled this down, you still have a few, you have about 20 MeV at 8 Kelvin still, and that means that, and the yellow phonon energies are around the relative ones, I mean, there are lots of them, because it's a big lattice cell, so you have lots of atoms per unit cell, um, and the relevant ones are about 11 MeV, so you have an issue that there's still too much disorder broadening at zero Kelvin to really separate that out. Any idea about the uh, zero electron trap centers, or is of that? Is it the negative defects? Or Ex yeah, exactly. I mean, that's a question that we should really try and answer better. The closest we are in that field, and you have to understand it's a very short field, is DFT calculations where people have looked at vacancies, interstitials, and substitutions. And depending on how much you trust the DFT calculations and their output, you could then believe in one or the other thing. It seems that if you try and identify traps of the order of a few tens of MeV, your best bets are these metal vacancies, tin vacancies in one case, or um, actually lead vacancies in the other. But there are a few candidates, and I haven't really seen much beyond people saying that the energies involved are typically a few tens of MeVs, and here's a DFT calculation, so it could be this, that, and the other. Because they are so low in concentration for the lead-based systems, I think maybe analytically it's just very hard to really say, and that's what it is. <laughs>
but metal vacancies is probably your best bet at the moment. So very quick uh, question. Have you tried the F18 system or a uh, Hermesinesi? Yes, we are currently looking at that. Okay. Um, so, uh, is it promising to...? I think there are quite a few publications out there that make it sh look better. Uh, I mean, with the work that I showed you there, you could see one possible reason for that, which is that you have a slightly different crystal structure. So it's got a slightly different band gap. And that by itself could then lead to a different alignment of your defect levels with respect to your valence band. And that, in turn, could give you better performance. So I think any, any tinkering with the TIN systems is probably interesting. I mean, I don't think it's as hopeless as some people say. I mean, it does have this propensity to form these tin vacancies much more strongly than for lead. So people say, you know, you get tin 4 plus instead of lead 4 plus. So there's much, just from this sort of formation chemistry, the formation energy is just different. Do you think if we use the uh, physical deposition, the 4 plus uh, state may be reduced? Since I haven't done it, I can't really tell. Uh, my gut feeling would possibly be no, because I think it is just the formation chemistry of these defects. However, one should never say never. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, when you go for the mixed allied systems, or even for the basic perovskite thing, you have, you know, the ion migration issues. Yes. To exist, right? So, is there uh, in your studies you have quantified for that, uh, accounted for that effects under the continuous illumination or yeah. during your studies have mm -hmm. you accounted for the ion migration processes that could occur, which could compete with whatever things you study? Yeah, so the ion migration is something that happens on much slower processes than what we look at with this recombination dynamics. I mean, one thing that that these studies don't tell you about is say how does this recombination dynamic change if you have ion migration and you have say maybe internal fields building up and things like that. Um, the thing is what I show you there is pretty much sort of what the intrinsic nature of this material is. You could say that that's irrelevant in a system where you see massive ion migration in hysteresis but I would counter to that that if you see that you're not going to use it anyway. So unless you can move towards a system that doesn't show this and doesn't show hysteresis, uh, you know, you're not going to be able to use this. And then for a system that doesn't show hysteresis, which is what people are moving towards, then it's these parameters that matter. These measurements that I've shown you here don't say much about hysteresis and ion migration. But people have, of course, now started to address this. They've said, OK. Mm, could be all sorts of things, ion migration. It seems that the contacts matter a lot. If you use PCBM with TR2 and so on, you can com come up with a system that does not show these effects. And so I think these are the systems that are interesting for us and that are well described by this. If you had ion migration or internal fields building up, then things would differ. You would have sort of field-induced drift then and then you're not really in this diffusing regime. So it would be slightly different. You'd have to think about fields, internal fields building up, and so on, and model that, really, as a device. But you can still use it with these parameters then. So. I think that we have class after us, so please let's stand to say hello again, great talk.